Coming to you by way of the not-for-profit mainframe art studios at 900 Keogh Way in downtown Des Moines, this is 900 Views, a podcast about building community through the arts as we build an arts community. Today I'm with Brian Pierce, trail named TARP, of Portland, Oregon, who with his wife Amy Harwood co-founded a Northwest U.S.-based artist residency program called Signal Fire. You can find them at signalfirearts.org. Ryan and I are visiting from the shores of Lake Wapiki in an area of the Southern Cascade Mountains in Western Washington State known as Indian Heaven. I've had the privilege of joining a Signal Fire Writer's Residency dubbed New Words for Wings, and so I've been backpacking through the Lewis River watershed with Ryan, his fellow guide Cy Laird, and eight other writers and artists from around the country. About half the group is Portland-based. This six-day excursion of writing and hiking began in a van with a bumper sticker that says, Artists are intense. So, Ryan, why does it matter that artists get intense? Oh, well, I'm so happy to be here with you, Pat. And the premise of Signal Fire is that cultural change is slow and long-lasting and holds great potential for how we relate to the natural world. And so we thought if we take artists outside and invite them to fall in love with wild places, that they would in turn integrate that love for wild places into their work and advocate for those places and start some cultural change with that spark. So this was really more about the wild places themselves than the artists? It's about wild places and artists on an on an even level. I think that um, the wild place the wild places give back to us as artists in a way that is immediate and nourishing. And artists um, glean so much inspiration and information from being out here because we're naturally curious people. And so, on this trip, everybody's looking up things in the guidebook and. Um, you know, identifying things and telling stories. And that makes its way into our work after the trip. Um, So the way that the land gives to us is, um, I think, immediate and even sometimes measurable. And the way we give back to the land might take a little longer, but I think it's worth pursuing. So now this uh, podcast is a little bit about um, building that arts community. We've created a bit of a community here. I think. Tell me about this from your perspective. What is the arts community itself that Signal Fire is kind of inspiring or creating? Sure. So um, when Amy and I founded this, there was really a self-serving aspect to it in the sense that we wanted more artistic friends to go camping with us. (laughs) And we were, um, we both have a background in the activist community and, uh, lovely activist friends from the environmental movement throughout the Pacific Northwest. And at the same time, we were missing some of the open-ended thinking that artists employ in their work, some of the weirdness and unexpected angles that creative people bring to their their political instigation. I think in the beginning, we were just hoping for a bigger friend group uh, that we could surround ourselves to, to do these trips. And as it's gone on, um, the community has flourished beyond our wildest expectations. We have now over 400 alumni in in 10 years of doing Signal Fire. And so there are projects, uh, collaborations, and uh, relationships that have evolved out of Signal Fire that we're not even aware of. And we're always trying to track them down, of course, so that we can write more effective grant applications. But it's you know, it's inspiring to me to just see how many people are, uh, you know, excited about sharing their love for public lands through their artwork. What are some of the more powerful uh, collaborations that you do know about? Well, there's another podcast called Ground Shots that one of our alum, alumni, uh, Kelly Moody, does, and that includes several Signal Fire alumni. We've had um, exhibitions organized by alumni 
including last year one at Washington State University and at Pacific Northwest College of the Arts. We've had musical partnerships develop on trips. We've had publications come out of trips, like one-off journals and also our annual journal, Leaf Litter. We um, published the work of writers and visual artists from our alumni community. So yeah, it just keeps going and going. Aside from the projects themselves, what would you tell me about the relationships you've seen start to form and take shape and the meaning they may be giving to artists? Well, as you've probably experienced on this trip, this kind of travel is more intimate than your average artist residency. We're living together and forming um, a somewhat arbitrary and artificial community that becomes very close very quickly. And so people are out of their comfort zone and they drop their guard a little bit and reveal a little more of themselves than they might otherwise do that. And I think that it forms bonds that are long lasting and we hear about people staying in touch, reconnecting, they, they bring each other back outside and take each other hiking and they also support each other when they're back in what we call the front country, you know, curating each other into shows and, and uh, journals and, like I mentioned, collaborating together and just, in general, promoting each other's careers. So what does that word uh, community mean to you? How, how do you know that you are part of a community? What's that mean to you? I think that a community is always in flux and that a community is non-hierarchical and which is not to say that there can't be leadership in a community and we look to our leaders and our elders and our knowledge keepers to offer us lessons and, and guidance from the past but everybody in a community has an opportunity to contribute something based on their interests and skill sets and to, you know, hold up their little corner of the community. I think that communities are ideally sustainable for longer times. I know that empires rise and fall, but, you know, when a community is thriving, it is, it is nourishing itself and, and others. Uh, I think communities are open to outsiders coming and joining and contributing and that they can take new shapes uh, based on those contributions. And that's an interesting objective when you're running a, an artist residency because we, we are selective in terms of having juried trips and that can lead to an air of exclusivity. But we, um, we also have a lot of programs where people can just show up or opt in and that are free or very low cost and um, are subsidized by our fundraising. And so we try to be ever more inclusive because we know that that benefits us as a community. So how does uh, a residency program then, like Signal Fire, uh, I can think of asking, I think, this question from the Portland perspective. How would you say that Portland benefits, since uh, quite a few of your folks are involved directly there? Yeah, our, our office is in Portland, and we have um, five regions in the American West where we focus our programming. So we're actually pretty nomadic during the year, and we run trips in the spring and fall out of mostly out of Tucson. And so we're, we're sort of west-wide. And in terms of how Portland as a city benefits, Signal Fire runs most of our sort of day-long public events and exhibitions from Portland. But increasingly, we're having a presence um, also in southern Oregon in the Klamath and Modoc lands. And we do a lot of programming there where the, where the Klamath Reservation used to be down at uh, Klamath Falls and Modoc Point. Uh, we also do programming in the Blue Mountains of Eastern Oregon, Southern Washington, out by La Grande and Baker City, um, and then in the Sonoran Desert. And so uh, we have this sort of, uh, I guess, map of different nodes that we try to build partnerships within, and we draw artists from those places, and we also try to connect to environmental campaigns that are happening in those places. So we 
every year we we bring our van full of alumni down to uh, Oak Flat in central Arizona, where the White Mountain Apache are organizing to try to stop a giant copper mine from being built in their sacred land. And um, we lend some resources and support for their annual walk to draw attention to that. We have a, a pipeline campaign, anti-pipeline campaign in Southern Oregon. It's called the Jordan Cove LNG. And we're dedicating uh, resources to match artists uh, to that campaign to get them to make creative work in opposition to it. So yeah, we have a few different places where building those partnerships in. So you see this residency as actually building community in part through the activism of alumni and your ability to help organize them and connect them to specific pieces that need some advocacy. I think so, yes. There's always an element of advocacy to what we're doing. Uh, Sometimes we disguise it a little bit uh, to lure unsuspecting uh, artists in. But on this trip, for example, we've been backpacking in an area called the Dark Divide that is a the largest roadless area, the largest inventoried roadless area in Washington state. And it's been proposed for federal wilderness designation for decades now. And we met with Robert Michael Pyle, an author who has been a lifelong advocate for the Dark Divide wilderness um, and learned about its potential and and why it's worth protecting and how the timber industry has conspired to strip it from every wilderness bill since the 60s. And we think that the Dark Divide's time is nigh for protection and, and that another group of people learning about it and spreading the word through your voices through this podcast might just um, might just tip the scales in its favor. I'd like to hear a little bit about your work as a visual artist and how you've been working to build community because you've done some amazing projects. Um, the one that uh, struck me so interestingly is this piece where your art was, you, well, you describe it, where you took your art around and, and uh, people had to scavenge hunt for it, I guess, is a way to describe it. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I mean, I... I've always been a painter and drawer and visual artist, and um, since starting Signal Fire, I've been spending a lot of my life outside. And now with all the programming and the scouting involved, plus my own personal hiking, I'm probably on the trail four months a year. And so I've been looking for ways to bridge my fairly conventional studio practice, which involves a lot of uh, large-scale paintings that would never fit in a backpack with my uh, role in instigating folks to be outside and sort of uh, walk my talk in that sense. Um, So I've done a lot of projects uh, recently that involve sort of like treasure hunts or scavenger hunts where um, in in one case uh, you're physically assembling an an artist book um, following the clues in the text and piecing it together. And then in the piece that you mentioned, which was called El Dorado, it was sort of investigating the the joys and pitfalls of the role of exploration. And um, it was part of a larger body of work that was critiquing sort of like the idea of manifest destiny and the role of you know, sort of rediscovering and naming places. And I invited uh, people at the gallery. Uh, there, so there was a a grid of blank panels on the gallery wall when the show opened, and folks could check out a list of clues that corresponded to each of the panels. And every panel had a had a painting associated with it, the, a finished painting, and those paintings were buried in roadless areas um, around the... Pacific Northwest within a, I don't know, three or four hours drive from Portland. And people had to go find them. Yeah, people were invited to go find them. And so you would check out the clues and then, you know, drive out to the Lewis River. One of them was in the Dark Divide and, and you know, hike three miles up the trail and then follow the clues and plunge your hand into a natural spring and pull out a different set of clues and follow those to a secret waterfall that you and I saw. And <laughs> 
clamber up an old growth snag that fell over the stream and dig under the moss and pull out a painting. And then the idea was that folks would return them to the gallery and the show would be completed when all the paintings were back. And then after the show, they could have those paintings for only the cost of their journey. <laughs> and this worked. People actually did this. Uh, yeah, it did work. Um, it, they were all found within the first week, which was exciting for me and maybe too easy. <laughs> I can tell you that going to that waterfall was not easy. So I don't know how you got the clues. I don't know how they did it, but it was not, it could not have been easy. Well, before we go here, uh, a couple of things. One of them might be a pretty challenging piece. Uh, and you might want to take a second to think about it. Uh, but it's, I'm coming from Des Moines, Iowa, uh, with Mainframe Studios, where folks are contemplating uh, the value of artist residency. And yours is of a certain fashion, but generally speaking, when you think about uh, the value of residency both for the artists and for the community writ large, what counsel would you have for Des Moines in trying to pursue some level of artist residency? Well, I can actually answer this question outside of my Signal Fire experience as well, because I've participated as a resident artist in, oh, at least 13 other programs over the years. I'm a I'm a residency floozy, <laughs> and um, it's immensely valuable as an artist to have the time and space to create, and also the recognition and expectation that you're going to, to do your job, and folks can be away from their you know, day jobs and the other demands that take away from their creative time. From the perspective of a community that's offering a residency, it is really enriching to have that exchange and to be bringing in new ideas and artists are these conduits of creativity and of cultural exchange and so from from signal fires perspective for example we love it when artists um, stay in town with our supporters a little bit before or after the trip we can connect them to curators locally and um, that's led to some really exciting opportunities for artists who might just be in Portland for a couple of days. They get to meet some of our friends and some of our alumni and sleep on their couches and um, learn a little bit about Portland and our art, art scene and how, you know, how much we foreground the, the natural landscape around here. And um, I think, you know, so many artists would be excited to go to Des Moines and see what people are, are doing there and talking about there and, and have the chance to to work in, in your community. And before we go, uh, a question that's both looking backward and looking forward. Uh, Signal Fire, as a name, would love to know that origin story. And what is Signal Fire, uh, what is its future going to look like? Yeah, good question. So we named it Signal Fire because we'd both been involved in so many environmental groups that had awful acronyms, and we hated acronyms. And so... Amy and I decided we were going to pick something a little bit poetic, a little bit evocative, and that artists are essentially, you know, offer the potential of, of signaling out, you know, through our creations, the urgency of protecting the land, of giving back to the land. And so um, that's why we picked the name Signal Fire. The future of Signal Fire is exciting beyond my conception of it, I think, a big part of what Amy and I have done is build into our structure ways for other people to take on the leadership of the organization. And so Amy left staff last year, although she's still one of our guides. And um, I'm transitioning out of the director's role at the end of this calendar year, and we'll hire a new program coordinator. And I'm going to focus on our educational program, Wide Open Studios, solely. And so... Uh, right now we have a non-hierarchical uh, directorate of, of three people working together, and we have a board of directors, and we have a, a guide collective of, um, I think, 11 or 12 guides at this point. So we have a lot of people shaping the organization and a lot of new ideas coming in that Amy and I had, had never considered, and that's just so rewarding to step back after you start a thing rolling and, and watch it snowball and take new shapes and, and really grow. So how would you summarize, then, this evolution of it? In the present time? or Yeah, I mean, over 
over the past decade, what would you say has been this uh, evolution of signal fire? Well, from what to what? Yeah, I mean, I can, I can identify some major points of growth for us. I think you know we began it as an out of out of pocket art project um, with really low budget and and high risk <laughs> to personal safety, and um, taking on a, a founding board of directors and transitioning to the nonprofit model in a really cautious and calculated way has allowed us to grow and, and get support and to take on a much more sustainable model. When we hired our third director, Kaila Farrell-Smith, she's Klamath and Modoc, Native American, and she brought in a lot of perspective around the urgency to recognize tribal communities' investment in the land and, and indigenous sovereignty. And so um, our organization has grown a lot through her contributions and her efforts to build partnerships between us and the tribal communities that that live in or very near the places where we do these trips. And so I think where we might have started off as really uh, recreational and sort of just like fun for fun's sake, we've grown a lot in terms of the impact of what we do and the content of, of what we offer. Thank you very much. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be on this trip. I can't say enough about this experience and thank you for taking the time out. Um, they're back there swimming in a really, really cold pond right now. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not going to join them, but I might go watch. Thank you, Ryan. Thank you. It's been such a joy to have you on this trip and I'm going to go swim too. Mm-hmm.